and a warm welcome to all of you joining us on a Sunday at this important knowledge session at World Food India 2023 titled Unlocking Value Edition in India's Agri-Exports, Leveraging Innovation and the Startup Ecosystem. This session has been organized by the Department of Commerce, Ministry of Commerce and Industry and its four entities, APEDA, Spices Board, Tea Board and Coffee Board. The session partner for the seminar is Yes Bank. We will be having a context setting presentation by the government followed by an exciting panelist discussion consisting of leading industry players who will share their insights on promoting value addition in India's agricultural exports. May I begin with inviting APEDA Chairman Shri Abhishek Dev to give us introductory remarks and a context setting presentation. A very good morning to everyone, uh, distinguished panelists, uh, uh, colleagues from other departments, other commodity boards, and uh, foreign delegates. It's my pleasure to set the context for uh, today's discussion on unlocking value addition in India's agri-exports. So India is a major producer of agri-commodities, and uh, we exported around 50 billion plus of agri-exports last year and we have a rank of 7th in the uh, world agri-exports but as per our estimates the value addition in our exports is around 22 percent and there is a lot of scope for further improvement. So this session which we have, uh, we have distinguished panelists across the industry spectrum from the tea industry, from the coffee industry, from the spices industry and of course from our APIDA's bouquet of products and uh, the aim of the session is to discuss ways in which we can uh, uh, take measures to further uh, go for value addition in our exports and also how to leverage the startup ecosystem and also bring in innovation so that both our farmers, exporters and all the other stakeholders benefit from exports leading to increasing income for the farmers and also building Brand India abroad on exporting good quality agri products at a reasonable cost. So I'll begin my presentation. So uh, can you share it? Yeah. So this is the schema of the presentation, uh, I'll uh, have a brief session context and then we'll uh, briefly discuss all the products, all the uh, product categories. Uh, we will uh, discuss the export trends in each category, value addition, opportunities, key issues and way forward. Like I said uh, in the context that uh, we have exported around 53 billion of, uh, 53 billion of agri products to more than 200 countries and we are the seventh largest agri exporter in the world but uh, only 22% of our agri exports are processed in value added form. But let me add that uh, as per the MOFP estimates itself, uh, in our food production only 10% of the food producers processed. So in exports of course there is a lot of more value addition but there is scope to increase uh, value addition and processing in our domestic food production which will again lead to further uh, processing in the export sector also. So we will come to the APIDA products. So if we see the uh, export trends, uh, APIDA, is a, APIDA basket of exports is very huge. We have 17 product categories across 719 HS codes at the 8 digit level and last year we exported around 27.5 billion of exports. Uh, around half of our exports in the agri, uh, in the APIDA basket are cereals, 19% are other processed foods, 15% are animal products, processed foods and vegetables are 8%, fresh fruits are 6% and then the other uh, items. 
So if we see this uh, uh, graph, uh, we see that while uh, the big ticket items like rice, uh, they are uh, growing also, there is a growth in them, but the value addition is less. But one heartening thing from this uh, uh, graph is that most of the uh, uh, items like miscellaneous preparations, jaggery and uh, confectionery, uh, processed foods and juices, the rate of growth uh, of those products is very high. So over time, uh, we, we are envisaging that these product categories will grow further. Even this year, uh, many of our processed food items, alcoholic beverages, those kind of product categories are growing by around 20% plus. So we envisage that over time, these categories will grow further and will also have a bigger share in our uh, product basket. So in terms of forms of value addition, uh, the value addition can be of various kinds, like moving from uh, bulk packaging to consumer packs, marketing of Indian brands abroad, uh, in, imp improving shelf life based on innovation and processing, uh, speciality branding like organic GI, pro GI categorization of products, uh, new processed pro products like juice shots, millet based snacks, and also uh, in, uh, engaging in tertiary processing, which presently is very low, around 3% or 5% only of the total processed uh, items. Uh, moving into ready to eat, ready to cook segments, ethnic sauces, processed meat, etc. And uh, if we see the evolution of food demand, uh, India, China and Latin America right now are in the mass market stage, which is basically dairy, meat, fr uh, fresh fruits, fruit juices, beverages. Uh, we still haven't come to the uh, stage of diet, functional and organic foods and high technology items where we have North America, Japan, Western Europe and Australia and Eastern Europe. So our exports also are right now uh, not in those segments, but that is the future where we get the good premiums also uh, for our exports. So this is the future and uh, uh, we envisage that over time we will grow in that sector. And like I was mentioning, the key trends in the global demand are increasing market for uh, plant-based foods, uh, growing demand for natural organic products and uh, free from products. That means that products like we see the common labelings that free from pesticides, free from additives, those kind of products, rise of health food and functional food ingredients, rapid demand for convenience food and branding narratives on or origins. So the key issues uh, in promoting value addition in imports are that uh, the bottlenecks we see are at the farm level, uh, varieties and production practices are not aligned towards global demand. Most of the production at the farm level is uh, by, done by small and marginal farmers. It is difficult to aggregate and bring about a uniform quality in that. Uh, Post-harvest infrastructure deficit resulting in cost inefficiencies high in input costs and low private investment export oriented processing, uh, competing with low cost uh, uh, countries like Vietnam. Uh, cashew nuts is a good example where uh, our cashew nut industry despite historically being very good but has been totally out competed by uh, countries like Vietnam due to their advanced R&D and uh, good initiatives over there. Uh, again, a related point, limited R&D ingredient unavailability for innovating value add products. Uh, of course, technical barriers, quality standards and disease control, these issues are cropping up on a daily basis and lack of branding and marketing. Uh, like I said, uh, processing levels are very less in fruits only 4.5%, 2.7% for vegetables, 21.1% for milk and 34.2% for meat and 15.4% for the fishery items. So way forward for the Apida basket is building awareness of regular industry government interactions to grasp the demand trends and how to focus on value addition. We are uh, engaging with the industry like in the meat processing industry, we are, we are discussing how to uh, go for more higher ad value added products in that. Government incentives to adopt technology, we have the APIDA's financial assistance scheme, uh, MOFPI has its Sampada scheme, PLI scheme and uh, even the uh, Department of Agriculture and Animal Husbandry also has schemes for better uh, quality. 
adhering to import standards and quality here awareness is very important we uh, regularly interact with the growers uh, farmer producer organizations and also the state agri marketing boards how to introduce global quality standards expose them to the international standards this is going on uh, product uniqueness and differentiators traceability apida has a robust traceability system in grapes meat groundnuts and we envisage to improve that traceability system further by bringing in blockchain and also uh, exploring uh, bringing in traceability to other items so that uh, market could be created for our items then public private partnership is very important uh, to bring in r and d to know from the industry where where are the areas where uh, government intervention and support is needed and marketing of course uh, uh, building the indian brand brand abroad so coming to the tea sector india uh, exported around uh, 8.818 million of uh, tea out of which around 26% is value added tea and uh, as per the recent trends consumers are increasingly demanding natural and organic in ingredients in diversified blends flavors and environments and there is a growing interest in higher quality specialty tea and uh, it has also been seen that the consumers are willing to pay premiums for specialty tea healthy single origin tea and pesticide uh, pesticide free tea and innovation and premiumization and imperatives for the tea sector and there is lot of scope for further increasing the value added in the tea sector and in tea uh, exports uh, structurally uh, it is uh, relatively easier to go for value addition uh, the conventional tea can shift to from bulk uh, bulk uh, packaging to branded and retail packaging we already have good amount of uh, single origin teas specialty teas organic and natural teas and uh, even the uh, increasing trend uh, is there on uh, uh, increasing demand for uh, flavored tea, uh, flavored tea then there are special brands single estate teas and diversified products and of course we have the uh, very famous uh, gits darjeeling tea nilgiri tea all those teas uh, command a very good uh, demand abroad the issues uh, in the tea sector as we all know are that uh, the plantations are old and there is a declining productivity uh, there is a structural issue of increasing wages uh, small holders face loss of lot of challenges there are quality concerns uh, there is a stagnation in global demand and there are demand supply shocks due to geo geopolitics and uh, we also see that there is low innovation and product diversification in terms of way forward uh, there is an impetus to value add and startup segment uh, extension programs uh, at the farm level are very important at the tea estate level ensuring higher prices as in we realized are distributed across the value chain focus on branding narrative, uh, narrative and innovation and product development like i said there is lot of scope in value addition there are different kinds of segments in tea uh, that can be tapped in to Uh, cater to the demand which uh, is said to be stagnating in coffee exports uh, we have uh, seen healthy exports and uh, coffee exports are consistently touching 1 billion uh, of exports uh, since the last 2 years and our major export destinations are italy germany russia belgium and turkey and share of value added products in total coffee in, uh, exports have increased for from uh, 4% in uh, the year 1992 to 35% now and specialty coffee exports have also increased have also <coughs> doubled in this period in coffee also there is lot of uh, structurally uh, lot of scope for value addition we have different kinds of value added coffees like green coffee roasted coffee instant coffee uh, decaffeinated coffee then there is specialty coffees of india like monsoon malabar coffees organic coffees mysore nuggets extra bold bird friendly coffees a lot of uh, specialty coffees are already there then of course there is also a possibility of uh, value addition in by packaging improvement in shelf life uh, there there could be use of by products and also uh, extracts can also be added uh, to go for further uh, value addition in the coffee exports 
the key issues in the uh, coffee sector are uh, limitations in the area expansion and productivity and uh, need to have need to move towards sustainable practices uh, most of the european countries uh, are now demanding uh, sustainable farm practices and uh, these countries are willing to pay higher premiums uh, for sustainable uh, coffee and sustainable products but at the flip side uh, uh, places where the sustainable coffee is not there uh, there is a issue of uh, uh, stagnation and demand so this is the need of the art to shift to sustainable practices then there is a direct to consumer models and uh, coffee education and events of uh, india uh, this year itself a few months back uh, organized the world coffee congress uh, all these events are regularly being held and uh, there is a aim to move towards uh, e-commerce and digital marketing and uh, uh, coffee board has taken a very good initiative of um, building in a incubation center through the startup india scheme in, in the coffee board itself and they have a good experience of uh, uh, hand holding startups to further uh, coffee production and coffee exports and bringing innovative practices so coming to spices um, india is a leading producer exporter and consumer of spices and we exported around 4 billion worth of spices in <coughs> fy23 so historically india has been a very uh, strong uh, uh, exporter of uh, spices and a world leader and uh, it has uh, really shaped the uh, destinies of lot of countries uh, for spice trade uh, uh, through the old times and um, spices growth uh, has been good uh, in the late 90 late uh, 80s to uh, the year 2022 there has been a 14.6% increase in the value terms and 9.5 uh, percent uh, percentage share in the volume and 50% uh, share of uh, value added products in the export box basket major uh, spices exports are chili cumin mint spice oils and oleo resins turmeric cardamom and the major destinations are the, are the usa china uae bangladesh thailand uk sri lanka malaysia indonesia germany etc so value addition in spice exports so if we uh, break the uh, various categories 50% is in terms of low value added products medium value addition uh, products are 18% and 24% are the high value added products low value addition is in whole spices exported after cleaning grading the medium value addition means dehydration milling crushing and high value addition is moving into spice oils oleo resins and mint products and uh, the spice board has uh, put up a target of uh, 10 billion of uh, exports in spices by 2030 and they have a Uh, broken down the uh, export target into various segments so they uh, uh, there is a major push towards the single spices where they envisage to double the exports in this period spice blends curry powder and seasonings there is a even uh, more ambitious uh, target from 0.5 billion to 2 billion in this period and of course the, the other segments are there the challenges which we see in the spices sector are uh, in the input supply uh, there is issues in distribution and use of pesticides insecticides banned substances we we get lot of uh, alerts in the spices there are lot of uh, quality issues that we that are raised in the media which do uh, get addressed duly but uh, there is issues uh, there there is a need to nip these uh, nip these issues at the bud only so that these issues don't crop, crop up at the farming level uh, farming stage low productivity low focus on organic logistics uh, we see that uh, poor post harvest handling practices leading to contamination then there is issues of multiple uh, intermediaries in the uh, uh, chain which uh, lead to difficulty in traceability in the processing stage also there is low level of processing lack of focus incentives high processing costs vis-a-vis competitor countries like vietnam and china and a lack of suitable processing varieties uh, in terms of exports exports also uh, face a lot of challenges like quality issues mrl sps rejections lack of differential in, uh, incentives 
and uh, ASEAN countries impose higher duties for value-added products, which impact our exports of processed products. And there is also a need for a focused branding strategy for our spices exports. And uh, the way forward, like I said, the Spices Board has come up with a vision 2030 to achieve uh, 10 billion uh, USD worth exports by focusing on uh, higher end uh, value added products from spices such as spice oils and audio raisins. And uh, uh, it is envisaged that once we reach this target, we will see a value addition share from 50% to 70%. And this envisages various initiatives like focused uh, efforts on post-harvest management, emphasizing uh, spices of specific regions, GI spices, uh, strengthening manufacturing capacity, promoting technological interventions through incubation centers, digital, uh, digitalization and traceability, upskilling and capacity building initiatives, designing and implementation of quality assurance programs, Branding and marketing, uh, cap, uh, capitalizing on immunity boosting and other, other health benefits of uh, Indian spices. So uh, I will conclude this uh, context setting presentation. Uh, the session uh, objectives which uh, we see uh, from the side of the uh, PIDA and all the boards is that uh, we, we need to take a comprehensive view on what constitutes value addition and exports of our products understanding how to measure value addition and ascertaining the level of value addition in our exports, grasping global trends in value addition and global demand for value add products, which India can address in various categories, gathering critical issues, challenges, and the way forward for the industry and government to promote value addition in exports, how we can work together to bring in further value addition, and finally exploring how startups and innovation can be leveraged to enhance value addition on our exports. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the insightful presentation on India's agri-exports and the prospects for value addition. May I now invite our eminent speakers to join us on the dais for the panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Shiv Kumar, Head Agribusiness and IT ITC Limited. <laughs> Mr. Amit Pant, Executive Vice President, Tata Coffee Limited. <laughs> Mrs. Sonalini Menon, President, Coffee Lab India. <laughs> Mr. Sridharan Chandran, President, the United Planters Association of Southern India. Mr. Raj Barua, Proprietor, Adio Berry, T Estate Private Limited. Mr. Ram Kumar Menon, Chairman, World Spices Organization. Mr. Aju Jacob, Joint Managing Director, Synthite Industries Private Limited. And finally, the moderator for the panel discussion, APEDA Director, Dr. Tarun Bajaj. Good afternoon to everyone and panelists, ladies and gentlemen. In the context setting, Chairman Apida has now given information about uh, what has been, what is the present scenario of exports of agri products and what we are expecting from this session which we are concluding and I think it is an overwhelming response we have it for this session. A huge round of applause for everybody, please. That's it. Thank you very much. We all know India's agriculture is a backbone. And uh, that will continue to remain a backbone. Even if today, tomorrow, or in the coming times. And uh, as mentioned, that our exports are increasing manifold. In past one decade, we have seen a significant change. Um, the domestic supply, the, the other things have also improved at the same time. Uh, the exports in fruits and vegetables, cereals, buffalo meat, processed foods, 
tea, coffee, spices, they have all seen a manifold increase. And as mentioned in the context setting, we are now seventh in the rank as far as in agree exports are concerned, but the share is 2.33. And there is a huge gap between 1, 2, 3 and 7. A huge gap. Let's not forget. This is after feeding 1.4 billion population of our country. So we are feeding one European Union, one USA, and then we are taking care of our rest of the world. We are taking care of our food security need, and as a responsible nation, we are also taking care of the food security need of the world. Now the situation which is coming up is now the Time has come where 53 billion US dollar exports which we have made, majority is commodities. And of the processed food also which we have exported, a majority even in the processed food is private label. So we are also losing on the brand value. Here I will be asking my colleagues also how to take the advantage of the brand side. Time has come because the resources are limited. The population world over is increasing and the resources with the same speed cannot match. So we have to come out with new innovations, with new things and that will come through value addition. Value addition and through innovative techniques and of course the start. This seminar, as in the context setting, has already been mentioned what we are expecting, the takeaways and the outcome, which of course my panelists must have noted down and we'll be asking in our questions also, which I'll be putting out to them. But definitely, we are looking to new ideas, some of the practical ways, how we can have improvements in our value addition. Also, we will be asking, actually, do we need value addition or not? What kind of a value addition we are talking? Somebody may say we are selling rice husk and the milled rice is also value addition. But is it sufficient? This also we will be discussing in our panel discussions with this. And we have an eminent panelist. Let me take the advantage to introduce you to the panelist. My personal friend, Mr. Shivakumar, head agree in IT business, ITC Limited. He also holds the responsibility of ITC Social Investment Program. Additionally, he is also chairman of uh, Technico Agri Science Limited and vice chairman of ITC Infotech India Limited and its subsidiaries in UK and US. Really, a real uh, known in the professional field, very active professionally, personally, and socially. Thank you very much, Mr. Su. Joining. Another eminent panelist, Mr. Raj Barua. Managing Director of Aryobari Tea Estate Limited. He is the fourth generation tea planter based in Assam. His family started uh, tea business, tea estate business in 1897. And growing up in Assam with the family tea business, he took over in 1991. He is currently the Managing Director of this tea estate. Thank you very much, Mr. Raj Barua, for joining. We also welcome Mr. Sridharan Chandran, President of the United Planters Association of Southern India, and he was he is executive member of this association since 2006 and 7. Thank you very much once again to you. Another eminent panelist is Mr. Rajkumar Menon, Chairperson, World Spices Organization, and he has worked in the capacity of General Manager, International Business Division of Tata Tea and also served as a vice chairman spices board and he was also a board member of spices board thank you very much mr rajkumar anand also we have another eminent panelist mr amit pant executive vice president tata coffee limited he has worked across companies in institutional selling agribusiness soft commodities and international trade he has been involved with the coffee trade for past 18 years we are indeed privileged to have you as our panelist Another we are privileged to have, this is Sunalini and Manan, President Coffee Lab Limited, Bangalore, Karnataka, and she's president since 
1995. An independent director of Messrs. Stada Coffee Limited, one of the India's leading producer and exporter of coffee. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining with us. Another eminent panelist, Mr. Raju Jacob. He is Joint Managing Director, Synthite Industries Private Limited, established in 1972. And this is the real organization of spices, which is taking care of value addition in spices because they are into flavorings, extracts, and spices, powder, and all types of what we call of value addition. I think is the right person will hear from you what is value addition we are talking today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A huge round of applause for our panelists, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Please allow me to start from tea first. Mr. Raj Barua. Thank you very much for this. and. Uh, structure of tea production has changed uh, drastically in past three decades. We all know uh, with the 50% of it is small holdings. And this has a short term and long term implications. We want to know how do we address this issue of rising cost and food safety, climate change and particularly in respect of rise of Small holdings. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Bajaj. And I, a good morning to the entire audience. Uh, a question that probably would have uh, been asked to me as a panelist even 30 years back uh, about rising costs, demands going down. Of course, your, per, your, your key question was about the small tea grower holdings that have grown in the last uh, you know, 40 years, and they contribute 50% and more of the total production. The organized sector in tea has, uh, you know, there is a depletion in quantity. When I joined tea 32 years back, and I celebrate the 32nd anniversary two months back, uh, that was different. Let me tell you that at least in Assam, the parts that I come from, Upper Assam, it has uh, reverted, you know, the, the small tea grow movement has been the social dynamic change in our, in our state. A lot of the militancy that you heard of, a lot of the uh, unemployment that you heard of, that has been taken care of because the small tea grow movement is the movement that uh, led economic activity. And tea is today 200 years old in Assam. We celebrate, and India, the British tea industry. I'll tell you the main problems. According to me, the structure of tea, the industry, has remained same and it has it is a structural problem we have not got out of the colonial mindset in tea at least the colonial mindset the british east india company the dutch east india company they took their produce from their cash crops in their colonies to mincing lane in london and they commoditized it we today produce tea for the trader and the merchant. 99%, 98%. There is very little tea selling, you know, making that to the customer. We need to align to the customer. I've been talking to different people in this trade and they say that you, we need to all consult the customer and then move forward. We have to, in the future, take care of uh, value addition. I will come to that. But the small tea holdings, which I am a voice of, because I am a, I am a tea farm, I, I am a voice of the six lakh odd hectares of tea being, you know, that's, that's already stands. There are 600 crore tea plants that have been growing over time and evolved through this journey. As a farmer, 
in in all those you know and and in assam itself i was getting the figures 120000 odd small tea holding farmers we have a problem with rising cost we have a problem with rising cost just now which is uh, which has got political dynamics i'll not get into that 200% the wages have gone up in the last 10 years out of that in the last 5 years 3 is to 7 if you divide the, those 10 years so over those 5 years what's happened is that wages which constitute close to 60% of our total cost that is the kind of rise thankfully the covid came in there was a supply side uh, uh, downside and we had uh, year on year jump of around 38% nobody is talking about that uh, what's happened thereafter is there is an oversupply there is an oversupply all over the world when i joined t uh, the percentage of africa's production to uh, india's was around 25% today they are 53% and i've been talking again to people like dan bolton who's who's a journalist who who's come from coffee into tea you'll have to get me to stop dr bajaj whenever you want to <laughs> other i go on i have a thousand ideas for you uh, we would request <laughs> you to just, do it me, because we let me just let me just finish we'll be keeping coming back to you okay, also okay if I, if i have a repeat repeat question then then thankful i'll tell you i'll tell you this so uh, uh, whole of whole of africa is drawing whole lot of tea when i joined in 1992 the mantra for the policy in tea was that we produce 1 billion kilograms right we did that we are production centric we are following that same structure that was uh, uh, that the you know the brits set up we need to change that mindset that is i think and if you allow me another sec- second or third round i'll i'll continue with that thank you so thank you much. very much you rightly said there are structural changes which are required clap is always welcome and uh, over supply you mentioned on this side and so we heard t from a sam side i think let us now hear from the southern side we have a expert from the southern side so what do you think are the unique issues when we talk of uh, southern region growing uh, exporting tea and also we know that uh, the tea industry is presently in the chakra view of uh, stagnated price and flat demand so how do you think this uh, brand building value addition and uh, the gi all these aspects can help us in coming out of this uh, chakra view i'll call it and we'll be able to gain advantage of what we have what to you thank you dr bajaj uh, my uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to address this organization we at upasi are thankful for this opportunity to speak about the industry's concerns see south india uh, from a perspective of value addition and exports uh, ex- uh, used to export 50% of our production so uh, th- as recent as 2018 we exported about 100 million kgs which has now dropped to 85 million kgs so uh, now uh, we uh, we used to also export 50% of india's exports so now we the share has dropped to about 35 36% of india's exports is south india from uh, from the perspective uh, of value addition if you see the reasons for why our exports have dropped is uh, we have not really branded we have not uh, made i mean added value to our teas so our exports are totally dependent on rainfall in kenya or excess production in uh, in africa or some other country where it's completely price dependent so in uh, in in this context it's very very important for us to uh, to try to see what are the challenges in our traditional markets and what are new markets that are there and how to address it see when uh, again uh, we said we're going to define what is value addition see if you look at some of our traditional markets it's not it's they don't permit a uh, smaller like iran uh, does not permit anything less than 10 kilos to go in uh, if you if you see markets like uh, russia they have a 12% duty for bulk tea whereas for loose tea there is no no duty Uh, so when uh, in this we 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 should look at these concerns look at each market individually and address these concerns in 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 those markets uh, if, uh, if we should promote a single origin prom- see south india when we were contributing 50% of india's exports 
uh, we had just one GI tag in the Nilgiris. South has about six or seven very distinct regions. So it's important to see whether we could get uh, some GI tags, more GI tags, or something with uh, associated, we should be able to have some kind of an origin uh, differentiation and market it. So this uh, India, uh, the challenges that are there today, because when we had a leadership share in exports, uh, we did not cement that share by marketing brand India, Indian tea, South Indian tea, or, or regional teas. So uh, we've lost that share to some of, these, uh, some of these other countries like Kenya and Sri Lanka. The other, my request to all senior people from government that are here is, see, the global trade is change, changing drastically. There is a lot of geopolitics today. So uh, it's very important that government is nimble, acts fast. So uh, here we've had like uh, Iran, which is a very good market for South Indian tea. The consumers in Iran love South Indian tea. But we are losing that market share to Sri Lanka for some reason that it's easier for the exporters to get paid when they send Sri Lankan teas. So this is, these are things that are beyond, uh, um, you know, our in industry's, uh, uh, industry's control. So uh, I, would, I would request these, these issues be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, I expect a applause is always welcome, please. Thank you. Very well said that we should now go for more GI tag, go for more promotion, and instead of selling it in a bulk loose, let us send it in a more consumer packs. And of course, there are certain policy issues which uh, with the help of industry and trade can address it together. He gave an example of Iran. Tea and coffee, some of the similarities are there as far as challenges are concerned. So permit me to shift to coffee, then I'll come back to tea again after some time. And I, my question now to Mr. Raju Jacob. Synthite, uh, I'm sorry, I'm coming to now uh, spices. I'm sorry. Spices to Mr. Raju Jacob because, you know, you, you started the, your industry in 1970s. And uh, you are probably the right person because you are into real value addition, which we are talking about. Extracts, flavoring, and all types of... Um, new kind of value addition which is being looked after, right? which is what we are talking today. So how do you think? What have been your experience and how do you think we can achieve more in this sector? Thank you, Bajaj. Good afternoon. Um, it's great to, I mean, at least when the data were presented, it was very clear that the, in the spice industry, about 25% is value addition. And we as Synthite and uh, set up the business way back in 1972, my father founded the business. From the very beginning, the aspect was we started with the CFTRI technology, based technology, but then we found it was inadequate to take it us, us to the next level. So from the very beginning, we had uh, the, uh, an R&D set up in place way back in 76. And uh, the focus was only on validation. In fact, it was only in 2006 we got into spice processing. Otherwise, we were only doing value-added products like essential oils and oleo resins. The other aspect was the fact that you know there was continuous change in technology that was happening in this field, from solvent extraction in mode to supercritical CO2 extraction. There is spinning cone column, which again is used in certain spices specifically, but it also uh, diverges into tea-based products. We extract certain types of tea using the technology to make tea top notes and flavors. And what we also saw was late uh, 80s, um, there was a huge challenge with paprika worldwide. And we had India grows a variety of chili that is high in color, which we could substitute, okay, through process modification and technology, we could isolate the color and the capsaicin and sell the color as a competitive product to paprika worldwide. So India established the industry in, in the late 80s, early 90s. With all of this happening, the, the multinational companies who were buying spices from India to process, started to buy the processed products from India. Today, if you look at any of the flavor fragrance houses worldwide, India is a major source of supplies to them. And uh, uh, thanks to our efforts and uh, subsequently other companies have also come, up, a few other companies in the line. So Kerala has become a center for the value added spice products. I mean, we are losing a bit of the sheen or the edge because China's competed in certain areas. The paprika production that was primarily focused on India till 2005, 6 has slowly shifted to China. Uh, there are other areas where we have seen uh, challenges because Vietnam pepper is much more dependently available and quality-wise better. 
so we now have the i mean again way back uh, one of the things that the government did in terms of allowing advanced license in which we could import raw material and be competitive that's something again which kept the industry going but on the contrary now with the pli scheme we find that you know this though we are look in the government is wanting india to be projected as a manufacturing hub we are not being allowed to import spices for that from on a pli scheme we, st we still can import but then from a pli standpoint it is not being allowed so these are things where you know if you want to maintain the leadership being flexible and being smart as uh, as we were, uh, the other panelists were mentioning now being flexible in the case of tea same with spices also we got to be flexible in terms of our uh, government policies to ensure that we maintain our leadership because still india is the the largest producer of spice oils and rhodiorescence and the mint products where in mint maybe we've not given up to china because india is the leader spices also if you were to maintain that the policies have to be in line with what's happening in terms of competition to ensure that we remain our leadership in competition and um, the other aspect that um, uh, we would also like to look at is to ensure because traceability is becoming a huge challenge in in the industry because they won't trace all the way, way back to the farms there is there are issues around um, uh, pesticide residues because once you extract you sort of concentrate all the all the residues that is there in the spice so being able to produce clean is an eff uh, an effort and like the industry has taken a certain amount of effort to grow uh, integrated pest managed crops but that's limited whereas the concerted effort from the uh, the agriculture ministry from the f the fertilizer and the chemicals ministry is also important to ensure that we produce the right raw material so to ensure that there are no residues that are there in which then allows us to make products which are compliant worldwide so that's also becoming very important so through the history we have seen if you want to maintain sustain and maintain and sustain it's also important to make policy changes and also right government interventions in a timely manner to keep that going Th thank you very much. Uh, applause for uh, Mr. Raju Jacobs. So but as far as challenges are concerned, we'll be coming back again to uh, the panelists because, yes, these are challenges. And how to address these challenges, this is an important aspect we'll be discussing. Uh, you know, the spices are being uh, exported in various value added form. These days are going spices, but they go in whole powder, seasoning, condiments, and extracts which he is doing and also as a, in the form of capsule and COVID, you know, we also took uh, turmeric latte, I also took that time. So these changes are happening. Now, we would like to know, Mr. Manan, from you, what you see is the trend which is coming up in the time and how India can take advantage of that trend which is coming up. Th thank you, Dr. Bajaj. And Thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, in front of this August audience. Uh, uh, we have already been uh, informed about the exports of spices and the spice industry by the chairman, Napida, and Aju also has mentioned about spices. Now, coming specifically to, to your question, the, in the value-added exports from India are around 50%. And they constant, you know, spice powders, uh, um, isolates, uh, extracts, and oleoresins are the ones that form this value-added segment. Now, as you all know, uh, one of the consumption trends which are increasing is convenience foods. And when we speak of convenience foods, we, talk, we are talking about ready-to-cook, ready-to-eat, uh, you know, all gravy, uh, all-purpose gravies, in which spices form a very important component. And this is something that's going to increase. The second big uh, trend that we have noticed over the years, especially after the pandemic, is the uh, you know, wellness and health foods. Now, we all are aware of the benefits of spices with regard to health, with regard to wellness. And this is something that which uh, I think India as a, as a country should exploit. And we should promote uh, spices as health and wellness foods. And more research and development should be done in, the, in this aspect. And this is where we... Uh, request the government also to step in through their uh, you know, research institutions to try and promote uh, the benefits of spices with regard to uh, health and wellness. The uh, other pro uh, the, so this will call for investment in research and development and uh, something which probably the spice industry 
which as you all know is a very traditional industry. And, and uh, it's only now that it has started catching up on technology and you know, started investing in that. So this is where we need the push from government to, to support us and try and see whether we can take this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well said. Um, you said that now with COVID there is an advantage that we can talk of health benefits and spices can be promoted as in health and wellness segment. Yes, true indeed. But uh, that COVID, we, you will appreciate, has also given us some negativities also. And uh, the Europe, these days have become more price sensitive. After COVID, we have seen, which probably we didn't know. We, we, think, we used to think the price, high price uh, realization economy, they are now equally important. They have become price sensitive. And also there are geopolitical situations, Russia, Ukraine and other side also, and there are economic uncertainties are also developing. So this allow me to come to coffee, Mr. Amit. How do you think? What are the now, the current uh, long-term and short-term export challenges the coffee is facing now? How do you think you can address this? Thank you, Dr. Bajaj. Um, first of all, I'd like to briefly, uh, briefly exhibit here how value addition has helped the coffee industry. 18 years ago, when I started my coffee, coffee career, coffee journey, Vietnam and Brazil put together were 40% of the world's market. Cut to 2023, coffee has become a completely bipolar world. Between Vietnam and Brazil, more than 60% of the world coffee is harvested. Now, if India, and I think uh, uh, Chairman made very relevant points. If India had not invested a generation ago in value addition, India would have fallen by the wayside, like so many coffee growing countries in Africa and Central America have become. So really what has is, what is, what is sort of made India stay relevant in the coffee world globally is our value addition. Close to 40%, 35 to 40% of all coffee that is exported is value added. And at the heart of value addition is instant coffee, which I'll speak about. Um, so India today, incidentally, India started, and uh, including Tata's, we started this journey about 25 years ago. And today, India, while has probably fallen to seventh or eighth uh, position, notch, in the world of coffee growing, in the world of value-added coffee, which is instant coffee, is India is, top, is one of the top three uh, uh, players, right? India also today has the highest number of instant coffee plants anywhere in the world, if I take the branded, both the B2B and the B2C businesses put together, right? So this has been a, it's been nothing short of a stupendous achievement over the last 25 years. And I think this is critically the area India should focus. India has a coffee culture. India has no dearth of excellent technology, which is available here. And we've got facilities, we've got, situ you know, the entire environment ecosystem, which is very amenable to importing coffees for re-exports. Now, uh, to your question, uh, Dr. Bajaj, how, uh, uh, what's happened to European market over the last two, three years, and how, there have been two or three things, and I'll briefly speak about it. Europe today, uh, incidentally, over the last two years, for instant coffee, it's been a beneficial phase for two reasons. One is, when you had the pandemic striking, people wanted to, people stayed at home and desired stuff which was convenience-oriented. And instant coffee really fits into that bracket of convenience. So you could buy a pack, bring it home, stay at home, and have instant coffee over and over again. So it's been, it's, uh, the whole experience of pandemic has been, uh, I would say, uh, you know, a blessing in disguise for instant coffee, the world of instant coffee. The other thing which has happened, uh, especially after the, uh, after the invasion of, uh, after the Russia-Ukraine crisis, is that the cost of energy in Europe went up, which saw significant amount of offshoring to countries where energy was not as prohibitively expensive. So that's also been a blessing in disguise for countries like India. So which is why I'm saying these two factors put together over the last two, three years, especially with EU as, if we focus as the, as, as the leading market of instant coffee, it's been a beneficial experience for us. Before I give over the uh, mic to, uh, back to you, sir, um, I think what we are seeing today in the world of coffee is also a defining regulation uh, which is coming in, which is called EUDR. People, I'm sure some, many of you would have heard about this. This is the European regulation on deforestation. All the coffees which will come into, and I'm talking about bean coffee right uh, now, which will come inside the European Union from 1st of January 2025, has to be certified from deforestation-free areas. And to me, this is another s stellar advantage that India possesses. 
right? India, co the coffee which is grown in peninsular India is completely free of, of, of deforested tracts. And this is an advantage we should play rather than, you know, uh, cringing about it. Uh, to us, it is a significant advantage. Our coffee is shade grown, it's sustainable, and it's with a little bit of effort, it could be fully traceable. So this coming regulation um, in 2025, less, uh, just about a year, year and a half to go, would be another significant shot in the arm for the Indian industry because it just plays into exactly the sustainability, uh, you know, the, the pitch of sustainability that Indian coffee can be sold at. Thank you. Thank you very much. So EUDR, we have uh, different views. Somebody says they are going to affect and we need to enforce traceability. On one side, we have Mr. Amit, who is saying that this will be put to advantage to coffee. So it has an advantage and disadvantage, both sides. Uh, coming to the coffee, ma'am, Sunalali, you are concerned with several decades of uh, witnessing the Indian coffee sectors. So how do you see the scope of value addition and especially export of speciality coffee? Thank you very much, Dr. Bajaj. Uh, I, first of all, good morning to everyone. I'm happy to see so many faces over here, so many smiling faces. And I could also sport a very happy smile you know, after hearing tea and spices. I think coming to coffee, I can have a really happy smile because we have achieved quite a bit in coffee. Uh, I mean, the question that Dr. Bajaj asked me is a very relevant question about value addition to coffee. And uh, the, one of the interesting aspects about Indian coffee is the fact that as early as 1972, even before I sort of joined the coffee industry, we had a specialty, a very unique and distinctive coffee that we launched into the world market. Even today, we don't have anyone else preparing this coffee. So we really had that vision as early as 1972. We probably didn't realize that we had a diamond in our pockets, but today I can say we do have a diamond, and that's the monsoon coffee. Now, this is prepared from large-sized uh, 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 Arabica quality and Robusta quality beans, uh, which we prepared during the monsoon weather. Uh, on the west coast of India, just been completed between June and September of a year. And this coffee has been appreciated the worldwide. We get a high premium for this coffee. Now we're trying to see how best we could improve on these standards for these coffees. So that is in 1972, and we didn't rest with that. Then I joined the board in 1985. We set the standards for uh, Indian coffee. We went into, again, we looked at value addition. And that was with the focus on the step of processing, which is fermentation. I mean, today it's a very explosive situation for coffee, where we are looking at fermentation, but we looked at fermentation as early as 1985, brought out a very fine washed Robusta. Robusta is often considered a poor cousin of Arabica, but I think today, after the World Coffee Conference, I think everybody's gone back saying that, wow, it is a beautiful coffee, and India produces a very fine washed speciality Robusta. It's called the Robusta Kapi Royale. And I still remember at that time, you know, we had McDonald's coming in with chicken nuggets. So we said, hey, why not we use the word nuggets? So we use the word Mysore nuggets, because Indian coffee is often referred to as Mysore coffee. So we use the word Mysore and prepared Mysore nuggets. Again, it's a very, very unique coffee with a process on fermentation, large size beans, stringent quality standards, and most importantly for all these coffees, the cup profile, basically I'm a taster, so probably you'll hear some little language about you know, how I talk about the mouthfeel, the brightness, the, uh, the flavors in the coffee, and these are unique coffees with very distinct flavors in the cup. Now we didn't stop with that, we went into varietals. Now when you look at the varietals for India, the varietals are very different from all the exotic varietals that you see the world over. In fact, when I started my journey, I used to feel very sad about it. But today I realized that we had literally a gold mine again with us. Thanks to the research wing, thanks to the breeding programs, we were able to grow coffee in a country which is hot and humid. It's really not meant for coffee, it's meant for tea. But today, the coffee industry has surpassed the tea industry thanks to these varietals. We have Chandragiri, we have Selection 9, and in Robusta, we have a Robusta species called Congusta. Now, these are beautiful species with very unique flavors. You drink the Chandragiri strain, you think you're drinking a, a fruit juice. You don't think you're drinking coffee. It doesn't have the bitterness in the cup. You drink the Selection 9, it has an array of fruit flavors in it. 
You drink the congusta, which is robusta. It has twice the content of caffeine. It's said to be very bitter. But there's hardly any bitterness in it. So this is another way that we have been able to promote value addition by exporting micro lots of specific varieties, micro lots of specific uh, processing methodologies, anaerobic fermentation, double fermentation, aerobic fermentation, freeze-dried fermentation. I mean, it's an absolutely explosive scenario. We looked at micro lots of, you know, even organic coffees, biodynamic coffees. Araku, today it has reached literally the skies. You go to any part of the world and you'll hear the Araku, the tribal coffee. Now that is not just, we didn't stop with that tribal coffee. We have Odisha. Odisha again has beautiful coffees of a particular varietal of Selection 5B. Why I'm saying this is there is scope for India. I mean, India has always been considered, you know, not for coffee, but for tea. But I think the World Coffee Conference, we were able to drive home the point that India produces coffee, not just coffee, but quality coffee. I'm, I'm, I think after we have a coffee break, we are not going to like this coffee. <laughs> so, uh, but the views you have given is quite encouraging for the coffee. When I, permit me to come to agri sector now, we have, um, Eminent panelist, Mr. Shiv Kumar. Mr. Shiv, you have a very good experience. You have first-hand experience of both selling commodities, selling value-added, selling brands also. You are selling, sending to 60 countries, and I think if your share of export is 15 to 16 percent. So what are the factors which are affecting our export of value-added products? We fall back to private label. We fall back to private labor. So how do you think, what are the factors which are affecting and what needs to be done now? Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Tarunji. And uh, we heard some uh, great ideas uh, while across from across the panel. Uh, maybe my ears are closer to my left and right. So I heard uh, a lot more stuff which is relevant for the agricultural uh, products uh, in, the, in the wider array. Uh, you know, at one level, if you look at, if you would extrapolate the chart we had seen of uh, agri-exports to the current year, it is likely to be dropping uh, because uh, the largest exports from rice and wheat, uh, which also obviously need to support uh, domestic food security and inflation and uh, therefore there is a, a restriction on some of those exports and therefore uh, you'll have a lower uh, export uh, on those uh, products and, and so is the case with a few other horticulture products as well uh, onion in uh, particular and what it really uh, this is not the first time something like this is happening. It is something which has happened in the past also. That our higher order priority for domestic food security, and meaningfully so, higher order priority for managing the food price inflation, meaningfully so, means that much of the export volume, uh, I'll come to the value bit in a bit, uh, is a residual export, that what we have surplus, we will uh, export. Now, when you want to build value addition on top of that, you need to bring in investment into processing, value addition, customer engagement, and all of that. And then when there are restrictions that come in, then you have a period in which you get impacted, that I can't export or I have. Uh, many things that I need to take care. And therefore, the large-scale investment which are focused on longer term in some of these crops uh, didn't happen. And as a result, we continue to operate as a, a commodity player. But a very interesting opportunity uh, that is going to come up even in that space is what I heard uh, from Amit as relevant in coffee, which is equally relevant in case of rice and potentially wheat whenever we become an exporter and many other crops for that matter, is the trend of global customers wanting 
a decarbonized or net zero or sustainable regenerative, depending on different countries, different kind of crops, there is an interest. So how do you create that supply chain and provide that kind of a traceability on a scale is going to be our biggest opportunity. While the buzz has been there for some time, it has not translated into contracts and value premia just yet, but when it happens, that is the single largest opportunity uh, that will come because many of the global value chain players have already taken on net zero commitments and they need to be delivered. And for that, the back-end supply chains need to fulfill those conditions. And with a significant amount of headroom that we have in scaling up our uh, production, in making it uh, decarbonized, uh, in fact, uh, outside of carbon, water, uh, in case of rice, that is the most critical uh, input that we need to uh, reduce, and uh, uh, similarly reduce uh, emissions, uh, again, which is uh, rice and some of the other livestock products. So I think that is a very big opportunity that uh, we should systematically uh, engage in. The other side of residual export point really from a value addition perspective is how do you become more demand responsive? And if some of these restrictions can't be taken away from the country at large, it certainly can be taken through identified clusters in which that operation can happen, that it is a demand responsive value chain cluster we set up uh, in, in, in different areas for a co crops that we are competitive in. And in that cluster, we have a focus intervention of the various challenges that uh, the APEDA chairman has pointed out in terms of right from the farming uh, to the processing through logistics and all of that. So in those clusters, it is possible to do a concentrated effort and raise the competitiveness uh, a lot more. Uh, that is the uh, other uh, bit. And the third, in across each of these uh, uh, products, there is enormous opportunity to look at the uh, uh, products, specific attributes and traits, and the uh, <clears throat> geographies and origins where they come from, not very different from what uh, Sunal Niji has mentioned in case of coffee. So that is the other side across various crops that one will see in terms of what are the value addition that exists in these crops also. So formula really is in terms of focusing on a lot more on sustainable production and make it marketable, and to make demand responsive clusters so that we can intervene in making these chains competitive and identify specific niches in which India has an advantage and work on them. And all three together need to happen for us to get both scale as well as value. Uh, I think that's what is possible in no, agriculture. No, that's right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Shiv has uh, pointed out very rightly, it has to be demand driven. We have to analyze the demand and accordingly we have to work towards the supply and it has to be de demand response. I'll come back to Mr. Aju Jacob to you. What do you think is the role of innovation and R&D in uh, value addition and do you think there is a need of public private partnership in this? Innovation is what's constant, I would say change is what's constant. So from that respect, if you look at um, what's happening in our industry, um, just to give an example, if you could make a vanilla extract from rice bran using fermentation as a technology. Now today, a lot of these ingredients, which are single ingredients, components that get into various flavor applications can also made in a, be made in a fermenter in a lab. So there's a huge technology disruption that's happening in the space and probably the next 10 years would see that so you don't have to grow hundreds of acres of pepper or similar spices, you could get, make the active ingredient in, 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 form, in, in, a, in a fermenter. That bio-fermentation bio, um, bio or synthetic biology, metabolic engineering and biomanufacturing is one space we see as a threat like any other industry, uh, th that's the biggest threat or opportunity rather. Uh, in terms of moving forward in the value chain. So we, we are heavily invested in that space. We are working with the Cochin University setting up a biotechnology uh, facility so that because 
one of the thing is to develop the science in for the future so similarly there are uh, also like when people look at more organic or compliant food you are looking at solvent free extraction technologies where you use um, supercritical co2 you could use water as a solvent alcohol as a solvent uh, column chromatography which is just been in the lab uh, till recently now is being commercially being used for isolating active ingredients concentrating them so there's a the plethora of opportunities in the disruption that's happening for which we also continue to uh, look at uh, innovation in that respect and working as an industry alone may not really work that's where uh, universe i mean uh, academy of participation industry academy of participation is very important um, contract research labs working alongside is very important so that you need to be very flexible and open uh, to that the other aspect is about algal extractions where uh, you could grow algae which have got specific components i'm talking specific to the value addition opportunity where you don't necessarily have to get all of these from spices but you could grow an algae which is rich in a certain um, component and then isolated which is much easier compared to growing la- hundreds of acres of spices or similar material again the technology is also getting into processing tea based products coffee based products there's green coffee being processed to make uh, chlorogenic acid and um, you know um, a high uh, caffeine based product which could boost any um, not just ca- coffee but any other i uh, mean fruit juice to uh, to get the right caffeine that's required so these are um, interesting opportunity that's coming up in our space and uh, um, india and synthite and india is, is keeping abreast with that opportunity so that we don't fall back in the future thank you very much uh, mr manan on the spices i'll come back to you as i mentioned i'll be asking the challenges so what do you think are real challenges or are we addressing them adequately in short you know the structure of the spice in the industry as such is basically uh, composed of small and marginal farmers and and even the players in the supply chain they are also small uh, so that itself is a challenge and it makes the situation very complex because if you want to try and uh, improve production productivity uh, you have to you are up against many players and some of whom are they you know are not really aware of what is really going on going on in the world so the we, it's necessary to create awareness and and educate the uh, the that particular segment so that they understand the latest technological developments that are taking place now that is a very tough task and and you know i i'm from the world spice organization so we have been conducting training programs you know right with fpos and farmers and also you know down the supply chain to see to try and you know get this message across about various issue innovations what is happening in the you know as far as technology is concerned and that is a fairly complex uh, task thank you very much a- thank you very much now i'll be couple of few questions more i have it but i'll request my panelists to be uh, brief on this and mr uh, barua you we have admitted that we have not been able to capitalize as far as value addition is concerned on tea but what needs to be done now ab kya kare kuch to karna hai Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Raj Barua, because we have a time constraint. So, also, how I, I do you think it. what needs to be done now? Yes, when you talk of value addition, uh, see, in tea, value addition has been, you know, uh, uh, things like bubble tea, RTD tea, uh, uh, what else, kombucha, but that requires very poor quality tea. To this is a you know by products, and especially. Uh, 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 mr jacobs just left and i i with all due respect to the hard work they do on flavors uh, when you flavor a tea that's that's what you're drinking but that's a chemistry that is not a tea that's made by a tea master okay so uh, mrs menon thank you so much for the positivity you bought from coffee we need positive stories in tea we need similar stories and i have been aligning myself to coffee trends <laughs> because thankfully of dr jagadish 
I was in Bangalore and he said, you, are, you, you come across as a very inquisitive fellow, come and see us, we're doing a lot of stuff. And uh, then I opened myself up to specialty coffees and then I found out that most of the uh, people in the US, in the UK, David Lean from the specialty tea movement secretary has jumped from coffee to tea saying opportunity. Now there is this whole movement coming up for, uh, 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 you know, uh, tea and I travel a lot to China. So, and, and the, you know, the Orient. So, there is a specialty movement. And again, Mrs. Menon has mentioned time and again, standards. We have to follow we, and align ourselves to the standards of the world. There are people making green teas here. They're making oolong teas. Unfortunately, they're not aligned. Okay? I'm going to have to say that. It's a sweeping statement. It, the standards abroad are something else. So you have to align to the trends of what's going on. Uh, we are, our specialty is black tea. They are, they are different types of tea. Tea has got so many uh, positive stories that, that can be taken up with. We need to take all of that up. Uh, we are doing things insular. We are doing things, you know, I was talking to, I'm not going to uh, name the company, but one of the companies that, that's doing well as a startup and I asked them, uh, they are the ones that are growing up. They've, they've got the funding and all of that. Just another two minutes because it's very important. Uh, I asked, what is your competition? I said, I don't have a competition. I don't have a competitor. And I said, in India, you know, they, they are doing a lot of the, the uh, value addition teas exports. I said, if you don't have, if you're insular, and if you don't form a community, then I'm sorry, you know, they will, your, your customer, you'll find it very difficult to, to, to you know, kind of uh, decimate that into or, or promote your, your tea. Imagine, you know, whiskey. When we migrated from Indian, uh, uh, you know, blended whiskeys into sing, uh, single malts today, all the way up, if there was only one single malt, I'm telling you that because these are all aspirational, you know, trends. When you aspire, you aspire to see a range. I will make a sweeping statement again. If you ask me, even drop, the policy makers are here, drop the custom duties for specialty teas, say above 4,000 rupees. Get more teas, get people to imbibe, get people to see internationally acclaimed teas, get positive stories like coffee. And I think that's the future. Okay, that's an important uh, statement which you're giving. Uh, shortly, Mr. Shridharan, what planters should do now? See, I, I, to, I, when you look at value addition in, in the context, we should benchmark ourselves against Japan. See, India exports tea at a value of three and a half dollars. Sri Lanka, roughly about five dollars. Japan, it's twenty-six dollars. So this uh, twenty-six dollars, Japan also is not a very small producer. They produce about seventy million kgs of tea. So this has happened through innovation. See, we at Upasi have written to Tea Board requesting for a similar initiative like this Atal Incubation Center. So India is known for its startups, known for its innovation. So right now, see, research is very concentrated. Tea research is tea research. But how tea can be used for other uses, uh, there's not much work, work going into it. So there should be innovation coming in because recently uh, there's, lot of, there's been inquiries about tea being used for wagon leather for certain vehicles, etc. So Japan has done this in terms of bringing it to, to value addition. So this, we feel, is very important. And one suggestion we have is that, see, this, um, this RODTP, which was there earlier, uh, 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 which was about 5% uh, about was there, now it's only 1.7%. So the industry, Tea Board has done a study which clearly shows that the industry is contributing uh, more than 65 to 7% in taxes. See, you, we can talk, we can have ideas, but unless there's some funding behind those ideas, we're not going to get far. So right now, we, we, are, we appreciate the government not wanting to give subsidies. We at Upasi are supportive of that, but this funding should be redirected. A certain percentage of exports, not just for tea, but if tea today, 6,500 to 7,000 crores is exported, uh, if uh, there's a 5% uh, tax that is there, so that funding should come back into promoting brands to promote these different GI indicators, to promote Indian tea. Thank you very much, Mr. Shridharan. In fact, uh, that's a... Uh, uh, now, uh, with the good stories with coffee, short, how do you think FTAs and government regulations will uh, affect that? 
I think it's a very relevant issue. Uh, Chairman also referred to that briefly. Instant coffee, uh, so over the last 10 years has grown, has grown two times, from 1,500 crores to 3,000 crores today. In the last 20 years or 18 years, it has grown 10 times, from 300 crores to 3,000 crores. You can see the magnitude of importance it carries. Now, where we have a challenge today, and I appeal to policyholders here, if you look at the competing countries with whom we compete, Vietnam, Ecuador, Mexico, they have free access to the largest instant coffee market in the world, which is the European Union. Indian coffee is taxed at 3.1%. The, the fastest growing coffee markets, which is the entire ASEAN neighborhood of ours, we have a challenge. We sell into China at 12% duty, Vietnam is nothing. We sell into Philippines at 45% duty, Vietnam is nothing. We sell into Thailand at 30% duty, Vietnam is nothing. We sell into South Africa at 25% duty, EU has nothing. These are the large markets which will define our future. Right? And we've, we've worked with Coffee Board, we've given representations to the Coffee Board, starting with EU, UK, some of these ASEAN countries. If we are able to stitch up FTAs in the next few years, the, the, the potential is limitless as far as instant coffee exports are concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Sunanali, in short, what do you expect from government? Very short. Uh, I think we need a little bit more support in terms of marketing and branding. Uh, as I said, I think in coffee, we really moved ahead, as Mr. Shukumar said, market, uh, you know, consumer response and market driven. I think that's what we did in coffee. We looked at the market, we looked at what the consumer wanted. We started making drinks with the coffee husk. We started making drinks with coffee leaves. So I think the tea industry has got so much of potential. You're doing the tea leaves, but perhaps you could do something more with it. Not just adding flavorings, as you rightly said, Mr. Raj Barua. I think, uh, you know, in coffee, we have mushroom coffee. Imagine mushrooms with coffee. Mushrooms gives you the anti-inflammatory properties. Imagine if I could join hands, uh, we're already joining, uh, join hands with instant tea. We have a, an instant coffee and a tea mix. It's called cafe and tea. That's all due to the Atal incubation center, which the government of India has helped uh, to set up uh, in the Coffee Board of India in 2020. So we have the anti-inflammatory properties of both coffee and tea in this beautiful concoction. We have instant coffee in cubes, so why not we have instant tea in cubes? I mean, you can do so much with, uh, I mean, coffee, we looked at the market-driven responses. We looked at what the market wanted. We have the GI tags for five regions, and those GI tagged coffees, we're looking to see how we can innovatively process it and bring in additional flavors. We have skincare cosmetics. I mean, the sky's the limit with coffee. No, no, so no, we thank want, you very uh, much. You no, are giving just just you one line up. What I want from government is I would like them to help us in the marketing and branding. And that's, as someone said, 5% of the duty. Why not we give it back to coffee? I think we need that, you know, feedback. We need that FDA to be, you know, to come into move so that we can advance our coffees and put a smile on everyone's face. Thank you very much. You need government Project. support. Uh, yeah, thank you. So you need government support for helping build brand, but how to build international brand? Lastly, Mr. Shiv, to you. How to build international brands? So if you broadly look at two sets of uh, consumers globally, one is the Indian diaspora. Uh, the number of Indians living overseas is more than that of any other country. So that's a large market one could look at. So certainly the domestic brands, uh, as we build in India, is going to have a great rub off as we engage in a fair amount of digital marketing there. And it is possible to look at it. I think we have seen uh, expansion of our exports of brands in the recent past after our brands got established. Ashirwad Atta is as popular overseas as it is in India and so is uh, some of the other brands. The second when it comes to global native consumers of different countries where brand building is a lot more complex because it's not just brand but you need to also engage in uh, many other elements of the marketing mix. So I think that is where uh, a country branding by government and layering on top by the uh, companies as the individual brands is the solution to take. Uh, we have just seen the example of how Millets is built uh, through the current year and through the G20. While we are yet to see the commercial rub off of that in the branding, but I think we got a Millets brand for the country now and now it's up to the individual companies to build brands on top of that. So very similarly for each of these that we talked about, whether coffee, tea or different spices, uh, the India brand and on top of that as individual brand is what we look at for the global native consumers. Thank you very much. I think it has been a very enriching panel discussion. So many suggestions have come up.
coming from GI to public-private partnership, government intervention, and also of uh, promotions abroad, then brand building, cluster development, improving the supply chain, traceability, all these suggestions have come and I think all of us have been largely benefited. This, thank you very much, I convey sincere thanks to our esteemed panelists, Mr. Raj Barua, Mr. Raju has just now left, Mr. Shridharan, Mr. Rajkumar Menon, Mr. Ramit, Mr. Shiv Kumar, and Mr. Sunanali will come back to you for a cup of coffee. Thank you very much. You have been a very good audience. You have been very, I'm sorry I couldn't take a question answer, but during tea break, we'll be taking questions. You can definitely address and contact our uh, panelists for the tea also. We will be at the tea. Thank you very much once again. Now I request MC to take. Thank you very much, Dr. Bajaj, and to our seven panelists for an insightful discussion on the way forward for boosting value-added agricultural exports from India. Please give them a round of applause. May I now invite Deputy Chairman T. Board Sri Saurav Pahari to join us on the dais and present a small token of gratitude to honor our seven panelists. Come this way. Oh, okay. Uh, can I also request Dr. Reddy from Coffee Board and Mr. Cha from Tea Board also, please come on the front side. I request Chairman Apida to kindly come on the dice, sir.